Tonight we have Lauren Camp, the illustrious Poeta de Santa Fe. She has a new book out called Took House. She'll be reading some work tonight and also in conversation with one of my sheroes, Margaret Randall, um, longtime Albuquerque writer, activist, uh, feminist, world traveler. She's coming at us today from Albuquerque with a big, beautiful tree behind her. She'll be chatting with Lauren, and then toward the end, we'll open it up for your questions. So if you think of something you'd like to ask Lauren or talk to her about, you can type that into the chat. Um, you can also raise your hand at the end, and I can call on you. Right now, everyone's muted just for the sake of um, consistency and coherence um, while I am recording this event. And toward the end, we'll, we'll get to your questions. So again, thank you all so much for joining us. If you're just tuning in, I'm Amanda with Bookworks, um, Albuquerque's longtime independent bookstore, uh, functioning remotely here during the pandemic. We do have curbside hours several days a week where you could go and pick up a copy of Took House or anything else you might like to buy on our website. Our website is Bookworks Without the O's. So it's BKWRKS.com. And we have curbside hours Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, and also uh, in the morning and Wednesday evenings. You can find all that information on our homepage quite clearly. And if you have any questions, you can also ask me in the chat. So, hello ladies. Lauren is coming to us from Santa Fe. Um, I first met Lauren when she debuted her poetry collection, This Business of Wisdom, which was published by West End Press and the late John Crawford, um, I guess probably about 10 years ago now. Um, since then, she's gone on to publish several other uh, books of poetry. She wrote The Dailiness, 100 Hungers, and most recently, Turquoise Door, which was published by Three, a Taos Press in 2018. Tonight's book is called Took House, and this is just out from Tupelo Press. Margaret, as we mentioned before, is a longtime activist and an author. I'm not even going to go into naming her books because she's She's probably written about 90 to 100 books now. I'm not sure where we are with the pandemic. Um, we're gonna be hosting her later this fall um, with an Ecuadorian poet that she's uh, done a collection with. So we're excited for that. Margaret, thank you so much for joining us tonight and chatting with Lauren. I'll let you two ladies take it away. Well, thank you, Lauren. Uh, thank you, Amanda. Uh, we need to support Bookworks and all our independent bookstores during this time. Uh, and always really. So um, it's, I, let me just first say what a pleasure it is to introduce and accompany you, Lauren, at this uh, virtual launch of your new poetry collection, Took House. I've admired your poetry for so long, and I don't say that lightly. Uh, it seems like as, a, as I grow older, I think I demand more from poetry, and the work of fewer poets tend to excite me. When your earlier book, 100 Hungers, came out, I wondered how you would be able to top or even equal it, because that, that collection seemed so perfect, so, so brilliant and necessary. But Took House succeeds my expectations, taking me down new roads of exploration, of wonder. The poems have the same unexpected twists and turns. As I read, I often found myself waiting for one sort of solution and then discovering to my delight that you were giving me another. This is your fifth published poetry collection, each of them unique and accomplished in its own way. My personal favorite before now, as I said, was 100 Hungers, also elegantly produced as this one is by Tupelo Press. In that book, you explore the story of your father, an Iraqi Jew who came to this country following discrimination and hardship in his native land, and then couldn't speak about his experience until it was almost too late. In, this, in his last years, he began to answer your questions, but there were many more gaps than explanations from which you could work. And I remember at the time you were writing that book, we sometimes talked about that, and I remember your frustration. But because of your father's silences, you had to write out of imagination and conjecture as well as from fact. And gradually the poems unfolded 
revealing your father and also you through your father's life. In that book, it was your ability to release and then guide your imagination that came through to me so powerfully. I mentioned this because I felt somewhat, uh, somewhat the same after reading Took House. These new poems are filled with explicitly told stories, vibrant images, turns of phrase that startle in your craft. Yet in many of the poems, it is the silences or what isn't there, but is equally and amazingly vivid that makes them so successful. At first glance, it might seem to the reader that this new book doesn't follow a theme like 100 Hungers. In fact, I think the theme is our world today, this poor, broken world that suffers from an overheated planet, poverty, injustice, violence, displacement, pandemic, and unending war. And what those realities do to all of us, how they make us feel. Because you know, the, the political, the news is, is filled every day with the political events, but uh, I think it takes a poet to transcribe that into feelings. Some poets write about these topics directly, spelling them out in stark terms. These new poems of yours reference the more subtle underside of these issues, the ways in which they manifest themselves in human desire and interaction. What do poets inevitably write about after all? Familiar places and peoples, but today also the strange new world we inhabit, this world that is so disconcerting, often frightening, explosive, and seeking. And you do so as few others do. For those who may be joining us today and who don't know you as well as I do, I'll give a bit of biography. Lauren is the author of five poetry collections, 100 Hungers, published in 2016, won the Dorset Prize, and was a finalist for the Arab American Book Award, the Hosatanic Book Award, and the Sheila, Sheila Margaret Martin Prize. Her next book, Turquoise Door, Finding Mabel Dodge Luhan in New Mexico, that was pub published in 2018, was a finalist for the New Mexico Arizona Book Award. Lauren's poems have appeared in many journals and anthologies. Her work has been translated into Turkish, Mandarin, Arabic, and Spanish. Honors include a Black Earth Institute Fellowship and a visiting writer position at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. For 15 years, she was a producer and host of her own weekly program for Santa Fe Radio. She's been awarded residencies at the Taft Nicholson Center, Story Knife Writers Retreat, Willapa Bay Air, among others. This year, she was selected to be one of 100 artists and storytellers for 100 Offerings of Peace, and also one of the 101 women performers in the Scheherazade Project. She lives in New Mexico, where she teaches through the state's Poetry Out Loud program, the George O'Keefe Museum, Art and Leadership, uh, the George O'Keefe Museum's Art and Leadership Program, Santa Fe Community College, and her own community workshops for writers of all ages. And for those of you who may be uh, thinking they'd like to start writing or get better at writing, uh, I've heard really great things about Lauren's workshops. So please help me welcome Lauren Camp to BookWorks. Oh, thank you so much. That was such a beautiful introduction. Um, and Amanda, thank you and BookWorks. I was thinking that we, uh, we first got together with my first book, that that was how we met through West End Press, I knew. But um, yeah, it's been years and book launches and BookWorks, the, uh, the independent bookstore that it is has helped me 
share every single one of those books. And that's partly thanks to you, Amanda. Um, and so I'm going to pretend that Margaret and I are on the stage at Bookworks and there are books around us and books behind us and all of you in front of me. And I'm going to just pretend it's like that. Um, thank you to, to Margaret for inspiring me, encouraging me, supporting me, believing in me, um, not pressuring me, and um, just for being a very good, kind friend. I love you. OK, so Took, Took House is now uh, 19 days old. and. Um, I'm still incredibly excited to have it and hold it in my hands. I am going to read you a selection of poems from the book. They mostly, if I figure if I've done my job right, they mostly don't need introductions or else I can't quite give them. So I'm kind of just going to read through with uh, limited talk in between. The night clouds wrestled the sky. At that moment, I was blind to the sorrow and stop that was coming. For that gentle hour, I settled into the only split in the road where I still saw the purple reflection of day slipping from cedar and aspen. Air temperature as skin would shift to bare and brisk. But in the sky, unguarded orange shadows advanced and clouds extended to unkempt corners, the desert's chambers of gray. Trees unfurled their fluted, five-petaled, veined fingers, precision worth noting. What else should we look at but fugitive color, the shape that's not empty? So little of what happens belongs to us, only the frequent sense of being encircled. After light was stripped from the scarlet wall, a string of birds armed long branches, rhapsodizing. I had entered the chatter curved worship of their bursting, the song grafted to the moon's musky discipline. Once their noise was placed, it remained in my mind for years. Not a coincidence that I heard and saw a final stray sweep of sun as pigment and cord and would summon it again next time I was swallowed, beat down. That night, the sky came up to my lips it tasted of wind and gave me something to miss. Juice and distillation. We sat shoulder to shoulder over the sugared cuisine and the raw and the salted. I love you, I do, he said, and I sighed. If I was nectar, he was parched, a body without doubt, and later tasting with the sharp knife what had been unseeded. The harvest was plentiful that year. The next poem is called Weather, as in whether or not, weather. Tell me why being there was always ending. Tell it four times or six. I'm back to the twang of a body and its declaration. I'm not revealing the gaps, the familiar repeating strange without echoes, but want to remember driving into the mountains when there was hardly snow. So the book has three different elements that, uh, that make up the whole book. It has a main storyline, and I've just read you a few poems from that. It also has poems about raptors and other desert critters, and it has ekphrastic poems, poems about visual art, poems exploring artists and their processes. 
This next poem is called Draw a Box, and it is inspired by the wall drawings of Saul LeWitt. So if you don't know, and I've seen some smiles, so I know people, some people do, but if you don't know, uh, LeWitt had his art object was not an object, it was directions. It was how to do something. And the different museums and art centers that would agree to showcase these artworks, these directions would have to create them. The directions were specific enough that there was some clarity about what to do, but also open enough, varied enough, that the, uh, the people who were taking it on, who were doing it on the walls of the various museums and art centers would do different things because there was space in the directions to interpret how you wanted. So this poem sort of mimics that with sort of two voices, um, someone giving directions and someone doing the action in some fashion. The poem is called Draw a Box. On the white wall of your heart, a box. Without a ruler, I draw. Within the box, a word, anything you choose. I write, moan, lace, seed pod, stumble. Draw a circle that reaches the edges but does not exit the box. Then a vertiginous series of lines rising over a valley. To the east, sun tips up as though in a memory. Watch someone you know approach the box from the northeast edge by the wooden bridge. Quickly draw a door on your box. Wearing black silk gloves, a small, beautiful woman reaches for the door. Listen to the cerulean sound of her swallows. The tones swoop forward and settle on the ceiling. When she exits, watch her walk up the steep hill to a brick house you hadn't seen before. Under her arm, she holds an old delphinium she found in the box. Turn off the lights in your box. Feel the missing sides of the box. A glass. We never discuss. But right there, while I am hankering for a glass, he is drinking five with his insignificant mouth. We are moving toward linger, longer reminded of an instant uttered again. A normal week. I believe I've earned what isn't yet bitter. This whole town hides ghosts and my first sip is the last measure. I find the setting conducive, such an elegant empire of forks. Even the knives hold their judgments, no more than slicing. We are accommodating the room and the room is not rushing. The cup is empty. How desperate weakening can be. We both have houses with windows where we lie in every tossed night. We might be recuperating from darkness, the bend at the stairs, the crack in each hour. Here we receive the fruit brought to the table. We accept organ meats and small plates of cream. I lick the whole day and my belly fills. The candles crackle back. I remember nothing and nothing comes after me. Swainson's hawk. White throat and pointed wings, a perch in Spanish bayonet in shinnery oak in pasture. Small eyes tucking in to prey. I always forget the haste of dismantling the torn off evidence. Leopard, lizard, whiptail, kestrel, shrike. 
while stars are raw, a raptor feathered to the toes will eat grasped rats and voles, collect the flapping bats. Another bone, another funeral. The supply nearly endless. I'm arriving on time to a table. The mouth holds sorrows, teeth cling to the soundless. The leaves and root, the sunset rushes by. Somewhere, a rabbit warm in the hawk's beak. So I have a few more poems for you, but I thought I'd uh, break for a second and uh, tell you a little about the process of writing the book, because it was long. It was somewhat endless and somewhat appealingly endless in a way. I began the book in 2005, and here we are in 2020, a kind of dumpster fire of a year, but, um, but here we are, we've made it, and, and the book is here and in my hands, and that was a long, slow process to get here. So I wrote it and rewrote the poems and renamed the collection and rewrote the poems and pulled things out and put things in. And then at some point I decided probably a few years before I finished, just a few, that I needed something more to shake me up, to shake the poems up. And I added the raptor poems, which meant I had to learn a lot about raptors, which was maybe the best part in a way was was researching something I really only appreciated but didn't really know. And then I also added the art poems, which I had been writing all along. Um, so that was a little of the, the background of the, the book. As soon as I complicated it, it kind of came together, which I fully recommend. It was, it was, kind, of, it was kind of great in a way. Okay, so I'm gonna read you a few more poems. Uh, this next one is called Perennials. Each time I left the dark room, I took the bones of roses that had once grown in the alley. I took the tinted water and the succulent sun. So strong was my need that I then took the pale moon, filled eight pockets with pressures. Already I was tired, but I took and continued, less exact and more needy. Because I was opened by another, I will always carry these remnants of pouring light in my body. I must remember that my mind was disrobing and this wasn't pleasure, but loss growing like a bud. I returned past culverts and tree limbs, past the flesh of dry fields. I returned wanting to live in the future, to praise its perfection. I returned empty, without. So uh, I see my friend Michael Mercurio is here and I'm delighted about that. I'm so happy to see everybody who's here, but Michael taught me a phrase the other day that I didn't know, which is a bridging title. And this poem has a bridging title, which is a title, as I now know, that goes, um, goes straight into the poem. So the title is called Let the Other. And here is the poem. Let the other woman be identical. Let her be exhausted in pretty, in soiling. Let her not be too lonely. Let her protect what she knows and let one take blood from the other let one see each later version. Let her never keep her eyes open. Let them both have a chance to be tender in the beautiful rooms. Let them be strangers with distance. Let each rearrange the heart. Let there be viscera and wants and fact and fierce pattern. Let the hints happen little by little. Let the one scream, let there be sleeves of rain, let her open a map and decide to move forward. Let each form from the heavy edges in the black part of night. And one last poem, a short one called Ask Yourself. Out there the moon is lunatic. Beneath floorboards, rats build piles of mosses. 
The cat drags birds to the porch, often cataloging carcasses. Many times awe, then stupid variables. Every dawn, I remade the bed with urgency, then returned through the cobalt canvas sky. Thank you. Yay, that was fantastic. Thank you. An opportunity to really clap at the very end. I like doing that to close out the event. Does anyone have a question they'd like to ask Lauren? I can either unmute you or you can type it in the chat. I, okay, Margaret, go ahead. Well, that was really wonderful, uh, Lauren. It really gave us a taste for the book and I hope it wet everyone's appetite to buy a copy. Um, I actually had three questions to start off the, um, the Q&A, but I think I'm just going to limit myself to one because Lauren, you actually answered one of my questions by talking about your writing process of this book and uh, that was one of my questions. So anyway, I'm just gonna ask one. Um, on the book's cover, you're on the back cover actually, you're quoted as saying that you came to poetry while working as a visual artist, a career, and I quote, that you have left behind. And I would disagree with that because so many of your poems rely on or include visual images um, and the sort of images one might expect from someone who thinks and feels visually as well as literarily. I also happen to know some of your earlier art, for example, your marvelous series of fabric portraits of jazz musicians. So it's hard for me to believe that you really have left that behind, but perhaps have instead folded um, the visual into the poetry. Um, I also think that the work of artists who have explored two or more genres invariably draw upon one genre when working in the other. Uh, one enriches the other. In Took House, we find poems dedicated to visual artists or that riff off of things visual artists have written. Um, of course, you read the Saul LeWitt poem, which was wonderful. Uh, but there are also references to Eva Hess, George O'Keefe, Robert Rauschenberg, Donald Judd, Annie Leibowitz, and Pete Mondrian. And the book begins with a quote from Hess, from Eva Hess, um, which says, my right or wrong isn't to have a pure or fine edge. For those of us familiar with the discussions about the picture plane in Hess's time, this suggests to me an evocation of messiness, of complexity, the sense that what you see may be what you get, but at the same time is not really all there is, but an invitation to look deeper. This is a perfect definition of these difficult times and also a wonderful entrance to the book. So I wonder if you'd say something about your transition from visual artist to full-time poet. And if you agree with what I just said, and of course you're absolutely free to disagree. Um, I wonder if, if you think that your visual art informs your written work. Lauren. Um, I, I absolutely think the visual art informs the written work and I love the idea that it's folded into it, uh, that it's, um, that's, that's generous and, and one I'm going to, I'm going to carry with me, but, uh, rather than saying I've moved past it because the visual work is inside this and so is all the sound work that I've done, all the radio, music, mixing, active listening that I've done. Um, so there's that, and, and I loved what you said about Eva Hesse, that it's, that her work, her work didn't define itself. It, it sort of allowed us to figure it out, and it repeated and shifted and was strange enough that if you're willing to sit with it or look at it or engage with it in some way, something would be revealed, and it might not be uh, positive. It might not be comfortable, but there was something. I So I, I loved having her start this collection. I have been enamored of her work, her being, her energy, her, her sheer determination 
for many, many years. So, and the visual, going back to the visual art, I, I don't really see how working in color and pattern and texture and music, which I was doing in the visual art, could not be in me and come out in the poems. It, it has to, and it's the language that I have to speak through.